right now we're going to have the uh, Argentina panel, and uh, we're going to have some chairs put on. Uh, so I want to introduce your uh, moderator for today on this uh, very nice panel, Gerardo Simari. Uh, he's senior researcher at the Department of Computer Science and uh, Engineering in Universidad Nacional del Sur uh, in Argentina, as well as uh, part of the National Scientific Te Technical Research Council there. Um, um, uh, among the different accomplishments that Gerardo has had is a PhD um, from, in computer science from the Maryland College Park, uh, as well as different training programs at Oxford and, and Universidad Nacional del Sur. Um, I really want to welcome him, extraordinary researcher, and thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for the introduction, and thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. This is the, um, the second day, so we already saw the panels yesterday, and a lot of interesting topics um, are coming up, and so we'll continue this, this synergy. Even though this is the Argentina panel, we welcome questions uh, afterwards for, for the guests from, from whoever wants to. So um, without further ado, let me uh, introduce the, the first speaker, first panelist, sorry, Jorge Aguado who is an uh, industrial engineer by training. Um, so in the, in the private sector, he has worked at IBM and Dell Computers. Uh, in the public sector, from 2010 to 2015, he was general director of educational technology and innovation of the city of Buenos Aires. And uh, lately, from since 2015 to 2019, he was secretary of science and technology of Argentina, being responsible for the development of the national AI strategy that we heard from um, yesterday in, in, the, uh, in the special round tables. And since January this year, so uh, re very recently, he is the technological ad ambassador to the city of Buenos Aires. So let's welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Our second speaker is uh, Juan Corbalan. He's co-director co of the Innovation and Art Artificial Intelligence Laboratory of the School of Law of the University of Buenos Aires an adjunct deputy attorney general in the contentious administrative and tax matters of the city of Buenos Aires as well. And he is co-creator and leader of the implementation of Prometea, the first predictive artificial intelligence applied in justice in Latin America. So, welcome. <laughs> Our third panelist is Nestor Camilo, enterprise architecture director for the public sector at Oracle Latin America. Nestor has more than 30 years of experience in information technology with a special focus on digital transformation, smart city, big data, AI, Internet of Things, and cybersecurity. Uh, he currently serves as director of Enterprise Architecture, leading a team that works with the main government agencies in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. He has uh, also leadership roles in many innovation initiatives, including innovation labs, regional hackathons, and practice communities at Oracle Latin America. Thank you, Nestor. Um, second to last, Pablo Rocataglia. He is the, um, he's currently leading the data uh, team at Digital House, a leading ed educational technology um, firm with investors such as Mercado Libre and the TPG Fund. So thank you. And finally, we have Débora Shapira, who is an expert on educational policies at Universidad eh, Torcuato de Tela and academic director of the program on strategic marketing and innovation in sales at Universidad Nacional 13 de Febrero in Argentina as well. Thank you. So the way we are going to organize this is that uh, I'll give a few minutes to each panelist to um, uh, <coughs> You know, give give a, a short uh, talk on whatever they they feel is important for for Argentina, especially uh, in in their own their own sector. And then we have a few questions uh, prepared, and so open for the panel. And then we'll open for for uh, the floor. So we'll start with uh, Jorge, who, right? Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Gerardo. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Omar, for inviting us uh, in order to have this panel here at MIT at this summit. And in these few minutes, I would like to at least try to 
tell you about our experience in making a national strategy and, and also the new process in making a plan for the city of Buenos Aires in, in implementing AI. In order to, to explain the experience of making the national strategy, I don't know if you uh, have read about Simon Sinek, about the Golden Seal Curve. I'm going to try to use the, uh, the why, the how, and the what in order to explain that, that experience. So why we try to, to make a national strategy for Argentina and, and for us and for the government, it was a no-brainer at that moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to explain it in four, four big ideas. The first one is in order to uh, use the opportunity in order to generate and use new knowledge, in order to improve public services, and in order to manage in a better way the government itself, and in order to gain competitiveness and develop new markets uh, for the industry in Argentina. That was something that it was there and we wanted to structure it. The second idea was in order to unleash the potential that this technology has and in order to gain all the benefits uh, on using it. We want to achieve our government plan and all the different objectives we had. We had 100 objectives for the government at that time. We wanted to improve people's life, uh, as a matter of fact. And we want to develop the economy in a more inclusive and sustainable way. Uh, for sure, we want to make a country in which more Argentinians could have a better job. On the other hand, we want to reduce uh, all the threats of using the technology. Luis explained it very, very well. Uh, the problems of privacy, the problems of biases, the discrimination, uh, taking wrong strategies, decisions for Argentina itself. Uh, and in the end, look after always for the more vulnerable. If we don't have a strategy in order to think of that, Many things would happen not having the most vulnerable people uh, thinking on them. And the last idea was in order to be contemporary with the rest of the developed countries. For the first time, Argentina now, we can say that is at the same faith, not at the same stage, but is discussing the same things that developed countries are doing. And we don't need to be naive on this. This is a new space career. Uh, there is a geopolitical game around AI at this moment. I was representative of, of Argentina, the Digital Economies uh, Working Group at the G20. And between 2016 and two, uh, 2018, no country would like to discuss their strategies on AI. Just last year, uh, there was an open conversation between the different countries about what they're doing about this. Um, and I. And I can say that I have six countries that for me are the ones that are, are having the better strategies. Two of those, I put it a little bit aside on the table, they're having different strategies and they have different budgets, the US and China. But then we have countries like Canada, France, Korea, Japan, that for me they are working really, really well in order to use all the things different in, uh, and in order to get all the opportunities and benefits of AI. And of course, different multilateral governments in which the OECD, I think it's making a really good job. And within that, for us, having a strategy is gonna make us able in order to collaborate with different countries and be a partner with them. For sure, Argentina doesn't have the same capabilities that Canada or France or Korea or Japan. But we need to know what are our capabilities in order to add value for them and be able for them to ask us to be partners of their strategy too. So those are the four main ideas of the why. So how did we did it? Uh, the first thing was not starting from scratch. There are many things in which we can learn. For sure, AI is being discussed from 1960. But in the last years, as I said, the first uh, national strategy, I think it was from Canada at 2016. But we made a, a comparative study of 16 different national strategies in which we get a lot of things that we started to use for the national strategy of Argentina. Then we try to collaborate with different countries and different organizations. We have four collaborative agreements with countries. We have three agreements with different think tanks. And we have a board of researchers in which they are always trying to put us on mm. the same path on uh, the intelligent strategy of what is the new knowledge being done. 
Second, uh, having in mind all the different uh, bigger projects of Argentina, on 2018 we make the digital agenda for Argentina and also the 2030 innovation plan for Argentina. And those are like the rector plans for this national strategy of AI. Third, we started to make uh, in order to create and adapt the national strategy in a very collaborative and open process within the whole stakeholders. And from the public sector, we have all the ministries from the executive power, we have the Congress, we have part of the judicial power, we have from the private sector tech companies, but also not tech companies, from uh, that are national and that, that are multinational. We had the academia and R&D institutions. We have the civil society institutions with NGOs, but also the unions. We have multilateral organizations. And we've made like 35 discussion meetings, uh, very collaborative discussions. And we have almost 450 people involved. And at the same time, during this process, we decided to do pilots in order to learn from doing at the same moment in order to uh, improve what we were discussing. And going into the what, what we did. So we had now one national strategy of AI. We finished it on the last November. Uh, it, have, it has 12 strategic lines uh, that are grouped in two verticals and one cross initiative. The two verticals initiatives are one on the, of develop. We want to be part of the developing of this technology, not only using it. And within that line of work, we have talent, we made a new curricula in order to change the way we teach math, a new curricula in order to uh, teach uh, coding and robotics. The UNESCO now put us in the five countries that made a huge improvement of their curricula. Now we have to implement that. But we started from that in order to teach children from primary school up to secondary school, and in order to change the curricula of the universities in this matter but also trying to get more researchers and talented people on the area. In Argentina, we only have, so far, 40 researchers with a doctorate or postdoctorate in the areas of uh, science computing and AI. Also, <coughs> we want to make the new lines of R&D. What do we need to uh, research? Where do we need to fund? What kind of institutions we need to have now, uh, multidisciplinary? What kind of things our tech companies are uh, <clears throat> researching over there and, and, and developing. Another thing is that the way we're going to manage our data, not only the governance, but also the way we're going to be collecting the new data from now on, mm -hmm. and also our infrastructure of supercomputing. For sure, there's a lot of things in the cloud, but for some things, maybe we're going to need infrastructure locally uh, for different matters. And that is something that needs a lot of investment and we need to do it over there. In the implementation uh, vertical, the way the public sector needs to implement, just imagine the Argentina government has 2,500 decision makers in different areas, not having a unique framework in order for them to know how to implement new uh, deployments for their areas, it's gonna be a huge mess. But also the way to know how to make a public bid how to buy uh, different services and, and going on, in which areas we would like to implement the technology. The way the private sector, not only the tech companies, but every sector can implement this technology also. But the two more important things over there is the impact on labor. So we had great discussions with the unions. Every sector has a labor agreement in which yesterday we were seeing that welding is a, a job that is gonna be totally automated. Okay. A welder in Argentina, by an agreement that is totally binding, can change their work in a, in a factory. So if we change that, implementing a new technology, what is that person going to do afterwards? So there's a lot of things to work over there. And then the convergence between the public and the private sector. What the data that the public sector is the owner, we can do it in a very private and, and uh, with a great governance to offer it to the private sector so as to use it in new implementations. And the cross uh, initiatives were ethics and regulations. Luis uh, said it very, very well. International collaboration, for sure there are no more borders, but the regulations are national. And other thing over there, we had a huge opportunity within Latin America in order to make a regional strategy. We, we made a, a meeting on September last year 
in which all the countries from Latin America were there, and we started to discuss some things, and we hope that that would move forward. The communication strategy in order to have all the people in Argentina knowing what are the benefits of this, the threats, and the moment in which we need to embrace this technology and, and nothing else. <clears throat> and a huge text transfer office, like we call it an innovation lab, in order to have a continuous process with all these stakeholders working together. And also, this strategy has specific objectives mm. for every uh, line of work, and it has different goals that we need to continue. Then we made a national committee, a uh, multi-sectoral committee. It has 20 people that does, uh, that it has to make a continuous monitoring and evaluation. And it's starting this, this year, I hope. And then we made a budget. Uh, not putting a huge number at the beginning, but at least the national accounts, now they have a line in which every minister can put budget for the national strategy of AI. So at least from uh, a process standard uh, point of view, we made a, mu a huge improvement for next year uh, implementation. So in December in Argentina, we changed government. Um, there, there were national elections. I don't know when it's going to happen for, from now on, but at least there was one thing with, with the guy that now is on, <coughs> this, now the secretary of science and technology of Argentina, that we made an agreement in order to make a really good transition on this national strategy in order for him to keep going from what we did. This plan was perfect, definitely not, but perfection is enemy of good. So uh, I think that as a whole, Argentina now has a good strategy in AI. And now let me tell you very, very quick what is the new process on making a plan for, for the city of Buenos Aires. It's gonna have a, a different, a different uh, point of view. We would like to have a strategy within these next three months. For sure, nine women can make uh, a baby in one month. <laughs> but at least, <laughs> but right. at least with all the things that we have learned so far, we want to have <coughs> a, a nice strategy. strategy. For that? Do you have a strategy for that? No, not at all. Um, and in a very iterative process in which we're going to be learning and changing it uh, the way we're going to be doing it, you don't have it's going to have the same framework like the, de the deployment. If you like to know, Buenos Aires as itself. It has like the same radios of Israel uh, in R&D, the, the same amount of researchers. And on the other hand, in Buenos Aires, we have five of the 19 unicorns of Latin America. So it's a huge ecosystem in Buenos Aires in order to keep deploying uh, and, and making this technology. But we're gonna put a lot of effort on implementing and using the technology itself. Let me tell you two uh, <clears throat> experiences we have. One, in security and facial recognition. Uh, there's almost a year since implementation. For sure, uh, there are things that we, we need to change, but it was a great uh, definition or policy definition, like Luis said in the Pareto Frontier, that we uh, emphasize on the security besides privacy. So security for us in Buenos Aires, it was more important than privacy itself. So we decided to implement it knowing that we still need to uh, improve the way it was implemented. And the other one, it's, it's a bot uh, that it's, uh, hold, it's called Boti, and it's in, in WhatsApp, that now the people can do all the different public services and all the processes within that, and it's, and it's working very, very well. But the idea now in this new, new process is to work on a sandbox uh, strategy. We need to certify usage of the technology, not certifying the technology itself, if not certified the technology for different uses and knowing that there are some threats, but we need to know what are the benefits and if there are more than the threats, maybe we can move forward. And I stop having regulators that doesn't work in some boxes, but they work like in ring boxing uh, arenas. So we, we, we need to make a, a better process in that sense. Uh, and last, we want to work in eth ethics uh, and communications. The ethical problem is really, really huge. And we need to work that from a regional point of view and a very multidisciplinary point of view. And that is something that, for us at least, uh, take us our, our nap time very often. So I, I hope I give you a, a quick, a broad approach of what we've done. Thank you, Jorge. Yes, that's a very valuable point of view from such a central um, place where um, you know, we get to see how, how things were done. Uh, so 
The, the next speaker is, is Juan Corbalan, so also from the public sector, who will uh, talk about Prometea, I think. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, good morning to all of you. First, uh, I would like to thank to MIT, Omar, thank you for everything, <laughs> and the organization team, uh, Daniel Pastor, uh, co-director of our lab, and Juan Maikes, uh, general prosecutor of the city of Buenos Aires. Uh, it is uh, with great pleasure uh, that I share our experience of incubation and development of Prometea, an intelligent system in the public sector, which was uh, done from Innovation and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory of the School of Law of Buenos Aires, of the City of Buenos Aires, in conjunction with the Public Prosecutor's Office of the City of Buenos Aires. Um, during this experience, which was based on concrete and real problems. Uh, oh, sorry. Gracias. There you go. Sorry, because I. Okay. Mati, ¿puedes? Sorry. Refíjate. Um, well, during uh, this experience, which was based uh, on concrete and real problems, we have worked uh, with more than 100 organizations throughout Argentina as well as other countries. Civil registries, an Inter-American Court of Human Rights, problems of child pornography and gender violence, among many others. Uh, through this path, uh, we have learned three great lessons that uh, I will share with you through concrete examples, if it's able. <laughs> uh, lesson number one, instead, uh, instead of waiting of an optimal digital ecosystem to exist, we propose making rapid diagnosis to detect specific opportunities for the application of traceable, auditable, and interpretable interpretable machine learning techniques and suggest solutions to serve invisible and postponed people. For example, in the Constitutional Court of Colombia, which has a 20th century structure, we were, we were avail, able to incubate and develop a solution that, that coexists with paper files while at the same time allows uh, the selection of cases in the highest judicial body of the country. Now, we will see a concrete example of the incubation work done in the Constitutional Court of Colombia. The Constitutional Court of Colombia receives, on average, 2,700 protective actions per day. 1,400 of them are linked to the right to health. The court has a group of 40 people classifying these cases every day. Based on the machine learning technique, Prometea was trained to read the previous sentences and suggest a group of cases that the court should deal with with an urgent and priority way. Through a conversational agent that can be handled by chat or voice command, this new tool combines artificial intelligence, intelligent assistance, automation, and blockchain. To select the priority cases, Prometea asks for the period of time that the user needs. Then, Prometea brings the following information. Number of health actions received on that date, in this example, 1,428. And number of actions that were rejected. Next, Prometea brings up the detail of the most urgent cases, 32 in this example, which should require an urgent analysis, because the plaintiff meets two conditions to be considered a person of special protection by the state, according to the Colombian law. Uh, lesson number two, uh, thinking of AI as a complement to the tasks of the public worker under two major premises. First, the solution must be adapted to the context in which it will be development. The second issue has to do with what we call inclusive automat automation. Incubation and design must focus e essentially 
and adding value to other tasks, while at the same time workers uh, whose tasks we were absorbed by the machine are reconverted. At this point, we have learned to think of developments under the principle of progressivity and adap adaptability between, between humans and machines. Efficiency and optimum should be balanced with real possibilities of Im implementation. For instance, we have automated automate the generation of houses, housing allocations or the generation of specific conditions in public contracts. However, although it was possible to fully automate these pro this procedures, the application of this system would, ha would have been rejected. Therefore, during the design and training phase, it is essentially to think of automation nuances or simple techniques which are more convenient from a human or organizational point of view. Prediction and comple complementation of essential tasks was incubated and developed in a jurisdiction of the province of Buenos Aires in traffic accident cases. <laughs> As you will see in the following video, prediction all allows to improve quality and re reliability of judicial decision. It was during the training period that we have noticed that the system add value, reliability, and legal certainty without replacing public pow powers. As the director of digital government of the United Nations had said, this case clearly reflects the paradigm of augmented intelligence. The process begins once locked. Promethea offers the user the possibility of helping to resolve civil cases and traffic accidents based on the existence or not of the causal link. When choosing the option of predicting the existence of the causal link, Promethea asks the user to send a judgment of first instance of any civil court to try to detect if the causal link has been broken. The user has to search for the scanned sentence on its computer and send it to Promethea. After a few seconds, Promethea warns the user that it was able to detect that the causal link has been interrupted because the alleged fault of the victim is met. Promethea was applied on 86 real cases that were in the condition to be resolved. The result was impressive. Promethea made 83 correct predictions on a total of 86 cases, achieving a success rate of 96.5. Lesson number three. Uh, if we go to the corner, we don't take a plane. At first, uh, we thought that the whole strategy should be based on neuronal networks, deep learning, and prediction. However, we have learned that in order to de determine the right technique to be applied, due, cons uh, <coughs> due consideration should be given to the problem and context and each organization. To achieve this, we have developed a guide for good practices and a, manu and a manual that differences automa automatable, non-automatable from semi-automatable tasks. For example, in the general office acquisition of Minister of the Justice of the, Buenos, the City of Buenos Aires, out of 617 activities that are carried out, 30, 334, 38 are completely automatable compared 205 that cannot be, cannot be automated and 74 that can only be partly. Thank you very much for listening. For further information, we, you can visit our laboratory, laboratory's website. Thank you, Juan, for... 
Thank you. Thank you, Juan, for that report. I think it's, it's a good example of, of how we heard all, all throughout yesterday, we heard how um, we should keep the humans in the loop, of course. It's not that we're just trying to automate everything because that's dangerous. Um, so this is, at first, when you hear that they're working on automating uh, uh, judicial decisions, you're saying, whoa. But um, <laughs> when you see that they're, they're trying to, to you know, grease the wheels and try to make things happen faster, and the humans are not, are all, no decision is being made without a human, then it's, this is, uh, I think, a very, very valuable um, tool. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next up is Nestor. Hey. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, first I want to thank Juan. Really, the work that he's working on is not just in Argentina. I, I know him from Peru was very well. I was in a meeting with Justice Department in Peru, and they say, oh, you are from Argentina, Prometea. <laughs> and say, what is this? Um, I, I <laughs> tried to understand, see what, what was done, and finally found that this was real, that we, we have done some very interesting AI in, in, in Argentina by the hand of, of, of Juan, and she gave a lot of people the opportunity to work with this. So, this is really very, very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I have been working with AI from the, the time that I, I was in the university, but lastly in, 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 in Oracle, in the last 10 years, I was working for helping public uh, sector customer define problems. So, so, so this was something different than the standard way that uh, uh, vendors do business. Uh, we normally try to sell our products, uh, but we, we created a division that tried to understand the, the problem of the customer. And later, when we have very well defined the problem, we sell products, obviously, but first, we try to understand the problem and not put the technology first. And this is a very, very interesting way to work on. Uh, so the last 10 years, I have done this for Latin America public sector customer. We, we have a a lot of experience in justice, in uh, healthcare, in regional governments. Uh, and uh, I, I think that there is a, a potential in, in, in Latin America in general to cooperate. And I, I talk almost with two or three customers in different countries each week. There is no one that say, I don't want to share. But really what we don't have uh, is the highways to, to communicate. Th this type of event make it um, a lot more easy to, 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 to start the, the conversation. Um, one of the things that we, we have started to do a few years ago, and I, I, I was one of the, the creator of the, of the baby in, in, in Latin America, was an innovation lab. Uh, Buenos Aires, we, we have a very nice uh, office all of you are in, invited on, 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 on them. And we have our second innovation lab. The field was created in Sao Paulo because we're office in Sao Paulo is bigger than in, in Buenos Aires. But in Buenos Aires, we created a lot of methodologies. And this has to be what was said at first. In Buenos Aires, we have a lot of talent. We have a lot of people that have studied a lot of time and a lot of interaction with, with other countries. So we created an innovation lab where we have some technologies, some very basic technologies, uh, like a small robot that when you go near, they try to, 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 to poke it in, in your hands, but show that IA can be done in a very small part. Sensors in a, a smart city um, simulation that you, how easy can be to take a sensor and see uh, if the sound is more um, uh, on, in, in, in a level that is uh, dangerous for, 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 for the people for more than a few seconds, it's not just a car that passes, but it's sound, and send a police to say, okay, you can have this sound at, at, at this level. And this was something that a few years ago when I was talking with people saying, no, this is only uh, in the movies. And we created some uh, toys to, to show that this one not for the movies. And we, we break 
the space that what is reality between what is not, and we say, I can teletransport yet. But the rest of the thing is almost everything is possible. And uh, when we chose this and create some digital thinking way of uh, starting understanding the problem, uh, do digital stories, and create a transformational story about what the people can do different between what they can do with the real system and what they can do with the existing technology, you start to say faces that smile. Oh, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. And it's impossible, it's very difficult. No, probably we can do small steps to get to the big things, but we can create value very, very fast. So we have now innovation labs in almost all the countries in, in, in Latin America, all connected. The, the next thing that we, we have done that I am very, very proud, uh, uh, I managed an internal hackathon uh, in, in, in Oracle. The first one, we, we do hackathons for customers, but we don't do for, 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 for us. And we created one. Um, we, we got 125 uh, teams to, 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 to do this. Uh, and uh, uh, Latin America, for, for, for a company the size of Oracle, 140K employees, Latin America is a small, it's 5% of the, of the population. Uh, like what said yesterday uh, in Latin America, we, we have a lot of passion. 25% uh, of the entrances in the hackathon was for Latin America. 5% of the population, 25% of the entries in the hackathon. We, we, we put five more time people on the hackathon than the rest of the, the world. And uh, this was very, very interesting because some of the uh, material that was created in the in the hackathon uh, was on the top very very fast, and uh, uh, in the um, uh, um, uh, medical and in healthcare uh, panel uh, yesterday, I, I talked about the the, the, the winner of, uh, of of one the, the in Latin America that was <coughs> number three for for, for for the world. That was a system with virtual reality that help children with cancer to fight in a game that get more uh, power when they are doing well their treatment. And uh, the doctor can see the reaction of the children and can be monitored, etc. This was created in two weeks. It was almost incredible. The first time that we see dude, wow, you can do that? And this was just opening the space for people to <coughs> understand problems and use the technology to, 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 to create. Uh, and in the same uh, competition, we, we got people that understand that human traffic is a big issue. Uh, and they started to do some uh, experimental uh, about face recognition and sharing the information about social networks and, and some geospatial metric. And they created a, a, a project for doing just that, combating human traffic, children that are lost, in some cases are just lost, but in a lot of cases, there are children that go to other countries that are um, taken illegally. And uh, the, the, the people that created the, the, this solution are Oh, casualty from Boston. So uh, tomorrow they will come here and try to understand more the problem in Latin America because they, they were thinking more in uh, in, 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 in the US. Uh, but I, I think that this is the type of opportunity that AI image recognition can have for the good. Okay, so I, I understand the privacy. I, I share absolutely that I don't want to have <laughs> everything filmed, etc. But we have a lot of cases that make a lot of sense to have good uh, image recognition helping to, 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 to resolve some of the, the, the problem of the, of, of the world. So I, I, I want to, 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 to offer uh, the, the opportunity to work together. Uh, if you have some idea of a problem that needs to be solved, talk to me, 
is free consulting, is no attached with any contract. Uh, we, we can do it uh, in front in Buenos Aires office, near, if you have in another country, no problem. We have done uh, in Colombia with uh, village that was very far away, that was only about um, using a, a, a telephone. So we, we can do it in, in any way. Just ask, and I am available. Thank you. Thank you, Nestor. <laughs> so we're, we're already seeing some of the of the um, challenges. That was one of the questions that I'll, I'll be asking later. What some of the challenges: uh, technical, uh, educational, uh, ethical. Uh, speaking of education, so next up is uh, Pablo. We'll be talking about his experience from that point of view. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers and MIT for having me here. And for the last three years, I've been working on education about machine learning. Uh, it's a hot topic, but the thing is, it's not obvious how to do it and how to help people transition from their old jobs to new jobs. So the agenda for today in eight minutes or 10 or less, ten. if we can. Ten, ten before the pizza gets cold, <laughs> try to explain what happens when you have people trying to change their jobs, their, their lifetime almost. What happens when they insert them, themselves into new companies or companies that maybe don't have a tradition in technology? We have unicorns. Unicorns have everything figured out, at least in Argentina. They, they know how to handle these projects. But the thing is, what happens when you go to work as a machine learning engineer, data scientist, or data analyst, to a company that comes from an old industry, a mature industry? <clears throat> so, everyone wants to get into data, data science, having a data science team, it's almost mandatory today, but nobody really knows how to measure the success of these teams. Are, are, are we actually making money as an investment? What's the, the return on investment of these projects? It's really hard to measure the return, but there is one thing for sure, they cost a lot of money. Uh, they want to be, be paid really well, they deserve it, I guess. I'm not sure if you share that all. So we, we are certain that we are spending a lot of money, and we are not really that sure about what's going on on the revenue from all this. So what happens when you have people transition into these jobs is that they go into a company where there is really no uh, track record of machine learning projects, successful machine learning projects. So eventually, these projects tend to have a really high fail rate, failure rate. Nobody knows the exact number. If you go online and check different surveys, you'll see different estimates. As we all know, point estimation is always wrong, but it's always above 50, 15%, 50% 50 of the cases, so it's a lot. Some studies argue that it's like 90% of the machine learning projects that fail. Why do they fail, essentially? Uh, there are several stages in a machine learning project. Uh, I, I like this division from the people from Google, which they emphasize decision makers making in the data analytics process. So actually, to apply machine learning, you really have to have a good use case to start with, something that you know that you will be able to automate and that it's worth for the business to automate. And that requires a lot of introspection. What are we going to model? Is this something worthy to be modeled or not? Uh, for example, in facial recognition software, you are trying to figure out automatically who is in, the, in a picture. <coughs> there should be a use case for that. Yeah? You, you can't just throw people uh, to that kind of problem, a really hard problem, people that are expensive and have alternative uses without a good use case for that. What would be the use case? Well, something was mentioned by Nestor recently, identifying missing people. That's a really good example of an application. So in order to get to the machine learning part, you really have to have a case. And when you get to the machine learning exercise, what you're trying to do is automate like a cooking receipt. You're trying to cook something. You don't really know how to cook. And you expect the data to tell you how to do it by trying and probably missing it at the first time. Um, what's so hard about this is that usually the objective is not well defined. We don't really know what we're trying to do most of the time. Uh, you can imagine a, a new bank, an online bank, trying to do some credit scoring for new users. And probably they are trying to do, if they are doing it in the traditional way, some credit scoring in, in, in this way. They are trying to predict who is going to pay and who is not going to pay, and they will give you a credit if you seem like a good candidate for that credit. That's only half of the problem. If you are a new bank who has customers that don't have a credit history, a sufficiently long credit history, maybe you want to give them credit to learn about them. If your customer base is going to be people that don't actually receive credit before, how are you going to learn about them if you don't give them those products? So you can actually measure, when you have a credit scoring model, how much uncertainty you have in your predictions, and maybe you 
you can give credit to people where your mother is not so sure about what's going on. The thing is, that objective to be maximized is not very clear. We don't even know how to write that, that function to be, to be optimized. So it's a really difficult problem. It takes a lot of iterations. You have to think, put a lot of thought before starting on this project. Um, the other thing which usually happens is that the recruitment for this position, this positions is usually very crazy. Uh, there is another example also from the people of Google. <coughs> um, if you were to open a restaurant, you will hire a chef, probably, not an engineer. <laughs> the engineer maybe knows how to cook. I don't have anything against uh, engineers. May we have any engineer chef in, in, in the room? <laughs> it's a possibility. We, we are not that sure. But probably you will you'll do better with the chef. Why? The chef is going to mix ingredients that you already have. You don't need to build everything from scratch. So there is a big confusion at companies and organizations in general about how to engage, how to start in these projects. So the selection process for a data scientist in Argentina looks something like this. So you have your statistic challenge, your coding challenge, mm -hmm. and your infrastructure challenge, which is kind of the last one, the last part of, of the recruitment process. And in the end, you end up with a lot of people with a very technical background, probably people from engineering, computer science, mathematics, and so forth that maybe have no idea of what they are supposed to do with their skills in that project, in that company. So this is not working really well. And it's a management issue. We have a lot of talented people. There is a lot of people to do machine learning research. There is a lot of people to do applied machine learning. But you have to have good managers to hire people, to train them, to encourage them, to keep them motivated, because it's a very um, tough job market. People change companies very fast. So you have to keep a really motivated team. <clears throat> and essentially, what's going on, this is a quote I really like from, from Kathy Korsakov from Google, is that people hire data scientists or candidates who claim to know about machine learning without really knowing what they are going to do with them. In, in a way, very similar like drug lords buy tigers. For some reason, there seems to be an empirical fact. If you have any drug lord present, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> <No>? <laughs> They couldn't tell me, no? <laughs> okay. Maybe afterwards. <laughs> I, I'm wondering what they, 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 they filled in here. that customs. <laughs> if there were. Okay, well, no, no, no drag laws checked. Okay. So the, the problem is that if you do this, and we get a lot of requests from companies trying to hire people uh, that we trained uh, as, as data scientists, the process is not going to go smoothly. Eventually, people are going to work in a project that wasn't well defined. They will be disappointed. And what will happen next? What do you think? They are going to leave for another job at a serious company, or at least at another company that will pay them more. And maybe they, the cycle will start again, another project that fails, and so forth. And the value graded is not that big. The problem here is that recruiting these teams is very difficult. You have to have really taking into consideration a lot of factors. You should build a very heterogeneous team, both in experience and, and academic backgrounds, keep them motivated, define good projects for them to work on. It's really difficult. Um, I don't have solutions to any of this, of course. I'm, I'm only sharing my concerns. There are, of, there are a lot of good resources online if you want to start um, diving in into how to structure properly a machine learning project. There is a really good course by Andrew Eng from Deep Learning AI. Um, I was watching this morning how many people actually took that class compared to how many, many people took the machine learning class from Andrew and she. The ratio is like 1 to 10 in the other one. So not that many people seem interested in, in knowing about this, but this will, this will save you a lot of time. And the other one, uh, this guide for machine learning, is also really helpful. Uh, the second one discusses, oh, sorry. I always messed up the control. It's also really helpful. Uh, they discuss how to do agile machine learning. Um, we always hear about agile everything, agile whatever, agile soccer. It's, it's nonsense. The problem with agile is, is that agile requires a lot of planning ahead, uh, estimating the time for different tasks, experimentation, communication with stakeholders, and, and so on. And in machine learning, you don't get the chance to do that. You experiment all the time. You don't really know how much time anything is going to take. And you have stakeholders that really don't understand the metrics of the problem. So you're in a lot of confusion. Uh, one suggestion there would be to try to uh, define short 
um, objectives with a, a time framework, with a fixed time framework, and then try to accomplish the best quality possible in, in that time, in a short time. Uh, another bigger issue is that this is a more general problem. Uh, if you have a data science team, the chief of the data science team is usually involved some way or belongs in some way to the IT department in most companies. And data is not IT, it's different. So you have to start thinking about reshaping the structure of the organization. And there are a couple of resources on this. Uh, this is a book from last year that emphasizes what a proper chief data officer should be doing at this kind of companies. And there is also a, another great book by Laney about how to measure information assets, the value you derive from information assets, and how to handle them. So as I told you before, I don't have any solutions to this, references and, and sharing experiences. If you have any questions, this is my email, and I'll be around uh, in, in the break. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Um, I think these topics are very important for, um, especially because one concern that I, at least I have is, I haven't heard it uh, in this event yet, is that uh, there's a lot of focus on data science, machine learning, deep learning, and there's no, I, I've heard that some people have said that that's not all of AI, of course, but um, mm. there's not much focus on the educational part, at least, on what comes next. So everybody wants to get you know, trained in machine learning, deep learning, data, uh, analytics, uh, data science, out the door as fast as possible to get that, that job as a, as a tiger in the backyard. But um, uh, I think it's very important to, to also see what comes next because as these uh, sub-disciplines mature, I think we're going to see uh, a pull from uh, what comes next as, as you know, uh, the knowledge representation, uh, knowledge-driven uh, AI as well. So maybe I just put that out there for maybe for the questions. So, but um, let's hear from, from Deborah first, who is also uh, from, from the education part, and then we'll, we'll continue with the questions. Good morning. Thanks for Gerardo. <laughs> Thanks for Juan, and thanks for Omar and his group. And um, it's a pleasure for me to be inside the, the tower of innovation and technology. Um, we, we have in Argentina an important number of initiatives that develop careers of <coughs> intelligent artificial that belongs to the public and the private sector. These are very important issues mm, because we have an environment in intelligent artificial. But nevertheless, in my opinion, there is not yet a revolution in education. The principal challenge is to include the artificial intelligence as an input, as a model as a performer in the classroom. For this reason, I think this topic is the key issue of this analysis. It's very important. Why do, I, why do I think in this way? Because the expert program in artificial intelligence can improve and solve some different problems in education. For example, we can predict when the student leaves the school. We can predict how to reduce the rate of repeat class. We have the possibility to improve, to improve the rate of graduate. In Argentina, we have only the 30% of the students in the university that finish their studies and the high school, we only have the 50%. Mm -hmm. For this reason, I think it's the principal part of this topic. Mm -hmm. And we have to consider the artificial intelligence like a partner uh, with association with education. And we have to work together with this innovation, with this technical innovation. Mm -hmm. For this reason, I think this is the principal uses of the government 
the principalities <laughs> of the state. Mm? And in this way, I have only the diagnostic of the situation. But I think we can uh, develop some uh, strategic line to improve this technology in our education countries. For example, I think that the next steps in this item will be first, repeat this congress, these seminaries in our own country. Mm -hmm. Second, we have the possibility to take an agenda in the public sector. Mm -hmm. We have the possibility to make agreements with international institutions like UNESCO, BID, and other countries that can include these issues in the political. And we have to identify in our own countries which are the principal areas that can develop these ideas. For example, we have in Argentina the Minister of Education, we have a Council of um, the Dean of the University, and this area are the principal space to develop these ideas. And the other or the last things, I think we have to implement pilot experience. It's not necessary to, to think these items like a whole poly because it's very difficult. Huh? Sometimes we change our government and that politics cannot continue. But if we have an agreement, we have a pilot test, we can develop and uh, improve these politicals. For this reason, I think we have to work a lot to include artificial intelligence, not only as a career, but an issue and input for the education. That's all. Thank you, Deborah. So we have uh, just about 20 minutes left. So I, I was thinking that we could um, maybe answer a few questions that I, I have prepared and then open the floor to, um, to everybody who, who wants to ask questions from the public. Um, we heard yesterday in, in, the, in one of the special uh, sessions um, talk about the, the four axes, that there was a different name, I think it was called the, the helixes or something like that, um, for you know, industry, academia, government, and NGOs. And I think we've heard a, a, a pretty good mix uh, of this in this panel today. So what, where in Argentina do you see uh, uh, the challenge to, to find this, this balance, uh, so in our country specifically? Because it's, it's important to, to strike a good balance, uh, or at least a balance that works, not necessarily 25% you know, of everything, but to find a balance that works. So what challenges do you see um, in, specifically in Argentina to, towards finding this, this balance? I don't know whoever wants to take it. Okay, I take, I take the ball. Um, I think that the most important thing in order to get that balance is uh, develop trust between those actors. Argentina, but for many reasons, during the last years we have split all these actors and everybody can tell you why the relationship between the others doesn't work. If you go to the private sector, it's like, uh, the public sector is corrupt, they want to do something else, whatever. If you go to the public sector, they said that they don't understand what they are trying to do, everybody has an uh, uh, individual interest, and blah, blah, blah. If you go to the academia and the R&D sector, they tell you that they don't understand them and they just simply want to do something else. Or a lack of motivations as well from in, in academia. As speaking from, from my point of view, I'm from, from academia, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I could put my grain of, of, of sand there, is that um, one thing that we are lacking is motivations from, uh, I don't know, for instance, if in universities or, or CONICET or whoever is your, your main employer um, does not usually give uh, strong motivations to participate in these things. So there's a lot of, of um, 
of talk, you know, that this is good, this is important, but at the, at the, at the end, you end up getting, you know, a paper count or seeing how, how much, you know, you produced in tangible mm -hmm. uh, deliverables. And uh, these things often take time, right, to, to mature and to, to gain this because of this trust or, or because the projects are complex or they often fail, like Pablo said. Uh, so also this, but Definitely. sorry, sorry for, for the sure interruption. In each sector, you have to change incentives and, uh, and right. regulations or and rules. prizes and you know, whatever. Exactly. <laughs> But, but in the end, I think that uh, behind that is, is what I was telling about trust. And it's the idea of having a common goal for Argentinians. Uh, uh, for me, there's too many years since we, we don't have that. We always said that Argentinians are very um, uh, good with others and, uh, and given. But in the end, when you go to every sector, what they the incentive they have, it's an individual goal for that sector and not a common goal for Argentina. Mm. So I think we, we have a lot of prejudice and the only way to change it is to start working together. Uh, putting that aside and start making a trust and a cultural change and that is going to take time. Right. But if we don't put that away and we start working together and that is something that at least we try it in this, this uh, process that we make for the strategy of AI. Uh, it's going to be really hard to change it. And I think a good opportunity that we have as a country is that um, a lot of the, of, of the R&D, especially, is done in universities with, that are public. So it, it's part of the same uh, organism, right, or organization, like, uh, part of the state. So uh, you're, you're in government specifically. I'm, I'm a researcher at a university that is public. So, you know, the same budget is paying our, our, our salaries, essentially. So... Um, it shouldn't be that hard to align, in at least those two, right? Maybe the private sector is a different story, but uh, and the NGOs, you know, they, what, whatever they, they're after, but at least two of the actors should, in Argentina, be uh, better aligned, I think, because we're, we're part of the same team, essentially. They would have wanted to say something. Oh, um, I think that we can obtain trust um, getting on or uh, obtaining um, some a specific agreement, like the in the in the different ideologies of the of our country, and we have the international example like the Moncloa Pact Agreement, or the principal objectives of UNESCO that they can uh, agglutine all of the countries and they determine it, which are the principal objectives, and we have to to develop an agreement that can be um, during of the of uh, some years and for a long time and this is for me the the principal question there are principal topics like poverty health education that and they have no flight mm -hmm. all of them are the same and this uh, Things are very important to, to develop. I think this be this will be a, a useful issue to put in this as the result of this congress eh, to to generate this kind of agreements in the countries in our countries. From from the private sector, uh, I, I see that this is some very difficult. Cases, but there is some very easy case, and and, and like more to start with uh, the, the small steps, uh, uh, the wrong direction, but the small steps that get results. And uh, for example, I, I take the I allow uh, that is open, mm -hmm. uh, you can access very easy. Uh, we can do some project. That, uh, we, we do a, a, a meeting in in our office, opening the the innovation lab to share some things, etc. But really, if we start thinking, for example, in uh, training for young people, uh, we, we have a sample in, in, in Norway that started two years ago, I, I'm missing to, to, uh, I missed to, to, to men, that train people from secondary school, half day in design thinking, half day in programming chatbot, and they created wonderful things in one day. And we can do this. We have limits. We can do with a few schools. But if we think that the IA lab, the uh, the different part of the government can do this type, and 
if you ask for help with any private company that you want to teach people to be more productive, there is no problem. There's no budget need. There is a, a, a very, very few points that need to, 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 to be. For, for me, this is the best way to make trust, learning what some people do, learning what we can help. Uh, because the ideal model of the IA plan of, uh, oh, hopefully this work, but maybe it's more than a year to, to get started again on this. But we can tomorrow start doing this type of, of, of thing of taking people, that, taking children, to learn what to do and start working on, on, on this. And I think that this is the most easy step to, to take. Nobody can argue that it's wrong to do that. <laughs> Everybody will like it and we'll learn. <laughs> so, so you're saying that uh, as long as, as people are interested, the, the companies, at least the big ones, <coughs> will have funding available. Because that's one of our challenges as well from, yeah. from academia, at least from the public side, is that we don't have uh, enough funding. So for me, uh, I'm in Bahia Blanca, and, and just a trip to Buenos Aires, I'm not saying it's, you know, I can't pay for it, but okay. it's, it's already an expense that I have to think about. So okay. if... Uh, we can do online. And I have a... a uh, okay, I, I can pay for, 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 for uh, the, the, the food and on, on something. I, I don't have budget for doing a big, big project. But oh, no, no. I can invite some people, but we can do a lot of things. These, these short yeah. events, sort of like a two days or something like this, this will already, I think, make a great, a great impact. You know, I have a, a lab of, of a few students who are, um, you know, finishing, they're thinking about what to do, and if, if they're offered an opportunity like this to take part, you know, before they, they defend their thesis, at least they have a taste of what they will be doing, what they could be doing if they got a job in the private sector versus staying in research, so that, which is already what they were doing for their PhD. So I think this is very valuable. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, and AI deployments definitely need everybody from every sector right. in order to take it. Yeah. So every these small projects, pilots or whatever, are putting all the people together in one table and discussing. So that can make trust. The problem there is how to scale right. those pilots into a one. Uh, well, at least the, if you get success stories, yeah, right? definitely. I think that's the, the, the idea of the pilot. So, yeah. it's, uh, and also events like this, of course, it's very mm -hmm. valuable. Um, so, um, finally, the, um, before opening the floor, um, we talked a little bit about, like before I, I mentioned, the technical and ethical issues uh, related to deploying uh, mm -hmm. AI tools. Which ones do you think are the most challenging uh, today or, or in the near future in Argentina, whoever wants to take? I, I, I started to, to do some pilots to show people what can be done. And the biggest problem that we have in the region is that. We all talk about open data, we recite what this is, but really the data is not curated. The data is not real time, the data is not complete, and the data is not cataloged and similar in for different type of uh, industries of different cities or different countries, whatever. You can't compare things. And this is very complex because I can show something easy, but when we want to see benchmarking or trying to, to do so, Almost impossible. Well, we have the same problem in, in the research part. So we, we have to compare. When I develop the new algorithm to see how do I compare if it's better, and reviewers always want to see this. Yeah. That's, that's a worldwide. And I, I was motivated when the, in the yesterday there was a, 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 a talk about having some data organized, etc. I hope that we as a region can start doing some type of this this type of project uh, because if we start to do similar, a catalog of a few data that is the same for the bigger cities. A catalog of data that is the same for justice. Catalog of data that is the same for healthcare. We, we can start Well, this actually ties quite nicely into what I was saying before about the next things that are, that are the after machine learning, after data science and, and analytics. You know, this is a, an old problem. The semantic web was developed, you know, decades ago now. <laughs> And uh, it's there, and it's there are standards. There are you know serious efforts already in place, already implemented. 
uh, but I think there's a disconnect between the two cultures of the, of the quick and dirty uh, machine learning experiment that you know, every, every you know, younger person wants to do and you know, get their, 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 their feet wet or whatever uh, the metaphor you want to use, and the, the serious projects that we're talking about you know, in this forum. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe Pablo can, can give us some, some insight about that. Do you see a way to easily, not, maybe not easily, but at least move towards um, this, this, these issues that we're seeing with data that's, that's dirty and that's you know, very real, and moving towards repositories that are curated and um, shareable and benchmarkable and that kind of thing? In the private sector, at least, what you could have is a strong figure in, in a chief data officer that takes care of uh, the proper labeling and maintenance and having a repository of features, at least, of what information you have in your data lake. There is a tradition to store everything just in, in case, and in storing everything, you're storing things that probably you're not going to use, and even worse, you, you're not really sure of what, what you have in there, and that is, that is a big issue. For a basic analytics project or data visualization project, and even for a machine learning project, you need to know what your features in your data set are to be able to do something. Right. So we need incentives basically to, to adhere to standards, that kind of thing, right? Because otherwise people are just doing, doing their own thing probably and, and like you're saying, just you know, save everything just in case. And then you know, when, when the, the person who has to actually do something with it get, goes in there, there's, there's, a, there's a first like project zero to understand what's in there and then to see what we can do. And, and usually you stay there. <laughs> it's, it's really zero, different. 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Yeah. Uh -huh. What are you wanted to say something? Um, you just raise your hand. No, no. no. I, I think in, in the public sector, uh, it's very important uh, how to work with black boxes. Mm. This is for me the, the first uh, in agenda yeah. <laughs> subject. So uh, from an educa educational point of view, so how how to use yes uh, you know education and transparency and uh, mm -hmm. trustability and interpretable algorithms. Right. Right, it's part of you know, open government, that kind of thing. And for that, going back to your question about the ethical things, mm. what are the main mm -hmm. uh, issues over there? I think that for governments, at least, are the ones that have more impact on people's lives. Uh, mm. Nobody cares if an algorithm doesn't give them the exact or perfect choice of restaurant if you want to go there. Right, please. But when you go into health, security, judiciary things. All those staff, uh, if you want to implement AI solutions for that, for sure you're going to have like a huge ethical discussion right. in the society. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in our experience, at least, we try to make the ethical discussions in things that, or implementations that didn't have that, that discussion at all in order to know the way to manage it. Mm -hmm. So when we enter in our discussion in security uh, at the City of Buenos Aires, we know how to take it, manage it, but definitely when you enter in things that had values for the people, you're going to have a lot of ethical discussion. Right. Yeah, I was going to say before when you were mentioning the facial recognition, and, and your example was perfect, so a, a false negative or a false positive can have very different impacts depending on what the task is, right? So it's not the same for the restaurant or for, uh, even for a missing person, I don't care if I'm labeled as a missing person. Or maybe somebody comes and sees and says, "Are you, you know, I'm, no, I'm, I'm Gerardo, and so that's it." Mm -hmm. But if if I'm labeled as a criminal, that's a different story. So maybe this is this is, I think, the 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 issues that that need to be uh, discussed. And and there are things that there are standards, there are things that that might be done. Like for instance, the, these these things that we all have in our pockets. Like we always say, they have fingerprint readers, and. Uh, but but the fingerprint is not is never sent to Google or to uh, Apple uh, at, at least is what they say and if, if it's if it weren't true it, it, somebody would already know because people tear these things apart so um, maybe the the same kind of principles can be used for you know cameras that are looking at, at people and th these things are never transmittable so because any transmission can be hacked so uh, of course devices can also be hacked but there's uh, physical security as well so these you know huge huge things to talk about maybe we can take these to the, to the special round tables for, for everybody um yeah. no, no uh, in relation with the, the with the, the future actions uh, um, 
I have to, to repeat this issue because for me it's very important. There are a lot of applications in education that are implemented in Brazil, in India, that um, are expert programs to develop or to improve the rate education indicators mm, that can collaborate with the students to improve their difficulty in some topics like math, language, and well, I think we have the, there's examples to, to improve or to implement in Argentina with the, or of course, with the agreement for the education minister, but they are possible. Mm. Mm. Yes. Just two examples to, to finish that question is, we made two pilots, one in aquaculture, sanitation. Mm -hmm. The ethical discussion was almost zero over there, but then we made a pilot in uh, image diagnosis in MRI. Uh, the discussion are still open. Uh, mm -hmm. We are we implemented in in Fleni, that is a, a mm -hmm. huge institution in Argentina in in urology, and the main thing that you need to find in order to move beyond the discussion is who's responsible with something is wrong. <coughs> right. mm. uh, and there's no clear answer for that question in every implementation. And that is something that uh, we need to look forward because if something goes wrong and it's a huge solution, it would change a lot of people's lives right. in a bad way. Big, large impact. All right, so, right, so we, we used up all our time, maybe like one question from the public, maybe, or are we, no? no? One, okay. <laughs> well, hello, my name is Carlos, and I work for five universities in Argentina. Um, actually, I work for a lot of them. <laughs> oh, they, they are there, not uh, Bahia Blanca. I um, also have a um, very <laughs> intensive professional activity in data science. I'm a professor in, in data science and artificial intelligence. I, I run the postgraduate uh, course in Faculty of Engineering of the University of Buenos Aires. And I want to touch two very important points that taught very, very uh, everyday points. First of all, uh, University of Buenos Aires has 400,000 students and we, also, and we only have 10 to 15,000 students of STEM vocations. That's an incredibly big issue, not only in Argentina, in the world. So my first question is that, maybe more related to, to, to be answered by the ambassador. How can we manage? I also work with un the University of California here at Berkeley, and this is the, the same issue, the same problem in the States too and worldwide, but here they, they, they really know how to manage it. And the second question is more related to that, to a professional activity. We were talking about the, the, the problems. Me, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an instructor, all my best students, they used to go to very big companies like Mercado Libre, Despegar, the, the biggest companies in, in the country, and we as a society, we are needing to, to focus more on, on small businesses. And the problem in small businesses is that the information is very sparse, very difficult to, to acquire and to analyze. And also we need to incentivate that. So that's my two points. How to manage the, 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 the lack of STEM vocations. And second, how to work on real situations for small and, and medium businesses. Because there's a lack of, of professionals that want to work there. We have a dollar of 70 pesos. so. Every good talent used to work for foreign companies, and we need to incentivate that. Oh, I will try to answer <laughs> very quick. I don't know if it's going to be a, a full answer, but uh, for sure we, we need to start working on, on vocations if we want to change that path on the long term. Um, and in that sense, showing like uh, big success stories of people that is working there it's a start point, but then working on, on the vocations within the curricula. Uh, I was telling before that uh, last year we changed the curricula of math, um, putting robotics also and, and, and coding. <coughs> and that is something that the 24 uh, states of Argentina agreed on. 
and these two years they have to implement that on the schools and we started with uh, teacher training in order for them to be able to, to do that and, and the changes in the curricula and, and teaching that to the children. But beyond that we still need to change the way we, we teach at universities I think. Uh, young people doesn't want to be five years at a university, they want to to do more at the same time they're learning, they want to do more uh, on the real uh, life. So there's a huge change between mocks and online courses and a full career of five or six years. And I think that there's something in the middle that we need to work on. Uh, so it's, it's nothing that we, we have a proper answer, but definitely there's a lot of things that we, we can do. Mm. And beyond that also, we need to uh, the economy in Argentina gets better, for sure salaries are going to be better, there's a huge ecosystem that needs to, to move forward, but if you have the, uh, the vocation, for sure there's someone that more people will, will going to be there. Right. Pablo, you wanted to tackle the second part? Yeah, I would say that STEM education is relevant for research, machine learning. For applied purposes, you can have people from very different backgrounds that get some training and start working. Uh, yesterday we had a talk, I think it was Josh Gordon, um, he showed some code from TensorFlow, a basic code to train a model and evaluate it. It was five lines of, of code. You don't really have to build your tools, your technology from scratch. You can use all the tools that are already available and those tools are becoming um, more user friendly as time goes, goes by. You don't need to know about, a lot about programming to use TensorFlow or Keras or either of, of the open software packages for machine learning. But there are some baselines like Juan was saying about using black boxes. So, so a little bit you need, so it's, it's not like you know, a, a Lego that you just put together and that's it. Uh, I, I, I agree that it's getting much better, but there's, we, we shouldn't forget about uh, what, what Juan was saying about the black boxes, which is important as well. So, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 insist, no, I insist on free online education, yeah. probably very few of us know that the city of Buenos Aires has opening the course on data science with samples in Spanish. I just figured out the last week, wonderful. It uh, was done by a professor that I take it in, in mass postgraduate, wonderful. And it's open and nobody knows it. University of uh, Helsinki in Finlandia has a very nice course on AI for people that don't have any prerequisites free, certificated, available in many languages, not yet Spanish, but probably will have them very few. And uh, this is open for everybody. And this can be used for any type of companies. And I don't have to say it like a publicity, but we have an always free database, autonomous, with all the IA available, 20 gigabytes of, and two CPU of our most fast machine, open to everybody to play forever, free forever. You can do all the training on it. You can use for teaching, you can use for small business, you can use for doing tests, you can do it for using for production. Whatever you want, it's open, it's free. And I, I think that we need to uh, make this the word that the, the, this is because prob yeah. probably nobody know it. And, you can start tomorrow with very few resources. Don't be to the, the biggest corporation or biggest government. Can be anybody that want to do that. Right. All right. So that's all the time we have. Unfortunately, we have to, to finish. But I think we have some very interesting discussions to, to be had in the rest of the of the, the days that we have. So let's thank our speakers.